Warren Kinsella is a Toronto-based lawyer, author, and consultant. He established Daisy Consulting Group in 2006. Previous to that, he served as special assistant to Jean Chrétien, former Prime Minister of Canada, and Chief of Staff to a number of federal ministers. He has written 10 books, including one on international terrorism, a bestseller about organized racism, a novel entitled Party Favors, and Fury's Hour, a sort of punk manifesto about the punk movement. It contains exclusive interviews with Strummer, Joey Ramone, Joey Shithead, Bad Religion, and others, plus many swear words. He currently writes a column for the Toronto Sun and has a podcast called The Kinsella Cast, which has, among other things, a hypnotically good theme song, Welcome, Warren Kinsella, to The Bibliophile. Thanks for having me. I want to know about your father. Okay. What can I tell you? Um, His name uh, was Douglas Kinsella. He was a member of the Order of Canada. He was an immunologist and also a bioethicist, and he was one of the first people in Canada to work on uh, identifying and dealing with HIV before it even had a name, before AIDS had a name. And um, relevant to our present time, I remember him coming home and telling my brothers and I that they discovered this new virus, which they were then calling 3H for the patient groups that it was uh, affecting the, the worst which were Haitians, heroin users, and homosexuals. And, of course, that became AIDS. I remember him telling us that, you know, viruses are smarter than us, and they move fast, and they um, don't observe borders until we have a global approach to dealing with them. They tend to dominate. And, uh, and of course, that's turned out to be the case with um, COVID. So uh, that's uh, I I wish my dad was here all the time, but I particularly wish he was here right now. And he was particularly concerned with ethics. Uh, yeah, no, I always am. Um, I think that's really Please. how I become an independent voter and um, nonpartisan. Like, you know, I'm not under any illusions. I think political people sometimes feel they have to cut corners. And, uh, and you know, so too do most human beings and, and make compromises. And compromise in a democracy is a good thing. But you can't, you know, give away bits of your soul. And you can't be corrupt. And um, regrettably, I think we live in a time where a lot of those considerations uh, don't rank high uh, on um, the political radar. You know, I believe that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau is corrupt. I believe that his administration is corrupt, as evidenced by, you know, the Aga Khan, SNC Lavalin, just a whole number. I mean, he's the first sitting prime minister to be found guilty of violating a federal statute not once but twice you know and people just are shrugging about that and i think that's an indication of, of what i'm talking about that we do live in a time where corruption is is tolerated when uh, a guy like that can be reelected uh, twice as he has been and your father set up some kind of center for ethics in human research correct yeah in uh, calgary and he was the first dean of bioethics at the University of Calgary's medical school. And his predominant focus in the early years was reproductive technologies and how those needed to be, because te- those technologies were new in the uh, 1990s, the earlier 1990s, and, and the way in which um, those should be applied and, you know, how to do that in a way that's ethical and respects uh, human beings. I think that's one of the reasons why he won the Order of Canada. So you were rebelling against him by getting into politics, were you? No, not at all. No, he encouraged it. No, I was in a punk rock band when I was in high school, and uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, in the early days of the punk movement in Calgary, as in New York and London and other places, it was uh, very diverse. You know, you had gay kids, you had straight kids, you had you know, people of every ethnic background, boys, girls, skinny kids, overweight kids. It was a very accepting movement. 
because it really was a movement. It wasn't just about the music. It was about poetry and art and self-expression. And around 1979, um, the skinheads who I'd known, who had all been actually ironically into uh, reggae and ska and bluebeat, started embracing racism wholesale and neo-Nazism. And that led to a lot of confrontations. And that was the point where I really felt that music could only go so far in changing people's attitudes. And that was what persuaded me to get involved in punk rock. So I went to the uh, office of the Alberta Liberal Party, because uh, at that point, the Tories were playing footsie with Western separatism. The NDP was uh, irrelevant in Alberta. And uh, I was wearing a biker's jacket and Nick Taylor uh, who was then the, the leader, later became a senator, signed me up for $2. <laughs> I remember I made him nervous because I was wearing a biker jacket. He probably thought I was there to rob the place. <laughs> and um, that's how I made the crossover from music to politics. But I never left music. So a lot of my punk rock friends don't understand the political involvement. And my political friends don't understand the uh, punk rock involvement. But I, I don't really care. Those are both things that are important to me. And you know, uh, I don't really give a shit what anybody thinks about that. I think there's some really interesting parallels between the Dada movement and punk rock, especially graphically. So it's fascinating to see uh, to see the connections. Yeah, no, I agree. I'm a big fan of Jamie Reed, who uh, designed a lot of the uh, Sex Pistols stuff in the early days. I've got some of his work here at my place in Prince Edward County. It was important to us too. I mean, my mother's an artist. Both my brothers are artists. I paint. For punk rock, embrace that. It embraced expression. You know, you didn't have to be in a band. You could be a poet. You know, you could paint. You could, like, it, it was just, it was everything. And so the irony is, uh, I was, I've been in bands since I was 15 years old. But when the pandemic hit, obviously we couldn't play anymore. We did our last right. gig at the Bovine Sex Club in Toronto just for the pandemic hit. And uh, so that's when I started painting again. So I kind of yeah. did it in reverse. Usually what happens with bands is you're, you're in art school and you join a band. In my case, right. I did it in reverse. I was in a band and I went back to art school. Hmm. Well, turning to, uh, to, the, to the topic uh, of today's discussion, uh, um, political books, the genre, I just want to set the table for for us by, first of all, just listing the types of uh, people that, that write political books and, and then get into some of the different types and then motivations and then uh, look at some specific books with you. Sure. The types of people, politicians, political aides, political players, journalists, academics, Authors, novelists, posters. Okay. Yeah. And the the types of books, memoirs, autobiographies, biographies of uh, past and present leaders, histories, exposés, uh, current affairs, manifestos like Carl's, essays like Orwell's and Hitchens. Anything else that you can think of? No, that's a pretty exhaustive list. Okay, and then as far as motivations go, now as far as politicians, of course, there's pre-power and post-power. So post-power would be motivations would be advances. Then we get into raising a profile, your profile or increasing your popularity if you're trying to get elected. Explaining policy, putting your platform forward, identifying your ambitions and goals, justifying actions in in the case of post power, influencing the political agenda, uh, cementing legacy, writing history, rewriting history, making a comeback, changing the world, changing opinions, actions, minds, explaining the world and revealing secrets and getting revenge. Anything else? Yeah, I'm glad you said that last one, because that was the one I thought you were missing. Payback. <laughs> and so revenge. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a pretty comprehensive list. Okay, so let's then look at some specific books. Uh, you worked uh, with uh, Jean Chrétien, you're a big fan. 
he wrote, published, well, maybe he didn't write, a book called Straight from the Heart that, according to Anna Porter, sold more than 300,000 copies in, I guess, around the world, but mostly in Canada. That's huge. Yeah, he um, wrote that principally when he was out of politics. That was around the time I met him. Uh, How I met him is a bit of a story in itself. He had left Parliament, so he resigned as an MP, uh, and Turner was then leader. And I was practicing law in a little Ottawa law firm. We weren't in the same building. It was one of those situations where you have two towers, and they're kind of joined at the bottom. I was in 99 uh, Bank Street, and he was at 50 O'Connor Street. Yeah, no, well. And um, I used to go down, you know, to the main area at lunchtime, get myself a sandwich. And there would Jean Chrétien be, you know, lined up like everybody else. Wouldn't send a secretary down to get his sandwich. You know, he'd do it himself. And then he'd sit down at a table and read the sports pages and talk to people who came up to him or whatever. And I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. And he seemed very approachable to me. And then when Meech Lake came along, uh, which I objected to, you know, putting an interpretive clause in the Constitution without taking time to define what it means, he was the only guy around with guts enough to oppose it. So, you know, I read straight from the heart at that time because they brought me on as a volunteer to start working on speeches for him and correspondence and all that uh, as he was seeking the liberal leadership after Mr. Turner resigned or announced that he was going to resign. So straight from the heart became useful for me because, you know, when you're a speechwriter to a politician, when you're a speechwriter to Jean Gretchen, you're kind of the Maytag repairman. He doesn't need much help, you know, writing, uh, giving speeches. It was a useful book to me because it allowed me to understand him better. There was one point when I was writing for him, he became leader of the opposition. I became his special assistant. And part of my job was still speech writing. And I was getting it wrong, you know. And I remember he took me aside at one point and he said, you know, young man, that's what he always called me. He said, young man, you write beautiful speeches for John F. Kennedy, but I'm not John F. Kennedy. And basically what I needed to do and straight from the heart was useful for this is get his voice in my head. So I wouldn't sound like Ted Sorensen writing for Kennedy. I needed to sound like Jean Chrétien. I needed my stuff to sound like Ken, capture his voice. Which is interesting because as I understand it, it was ghost written by Ron Graham, but Graham used a lot of tapes that uh, contained conversations and interviews that he conducted with Gretchen. Yeah, so is that really ghostwritten? I mean, if somebody is just working from tapes, I mean, that's a respected and time-honored tradition of writing a book. So I, I do believe he wrote that book, you know, as well as, you know, the new ones, like My Stories, My Times, the two volumes he's done most recently. Because he, that is how he works. He'll he'll dictate it, and then somebody will take it and type it up, and then he shapes it into a narrative, either with the help of somebody like Ron or or myself or whomever. But they're much more than is the case for some other politicians. Uh, I think when you're reading Kretschmann's books, you're getting a you're getting his voice, you're getting his thinking. It is an interesting question, though, isn't it? Because the fact that a book, you know, and I'm thinking about the Clintons, for example, the fact that a book is ghostwritten, the question arises, well, to what extent? Yeah, for sure. And it's a legitimate question that I'm sure every reader asks themselves when they're reading these political books is how much of him or her am I getting? How much is, you know, their real voice? And of course, you know, the process is designed for that question never to be fully answered. But to me, the, the more, the bigger question is there, are they getting juicy stuff? Are they getting good I, stuff? A lot of political books I just find are boring. They're designed to sanitize somebody's CV or sanitize the truth and be non-controversial. That's why I think political books just don't sell as much as they used to. Certainly, especially around Trump, sales are booming. But those would be yeah, books. Yeah, but that's in the United States, sure. right? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, talking uh, English, I'm talking English-speaking world here. Yeah, yeah for sure. But, uh, you know, I, I'm talking about Canadian books. Okay. You know, the last two really big sellers 
that I'm aware of were straight from the heart, which you referred to, and yeah. Stevie Cameron's on the take, which are two different sides of you know the politics. One was about showing the the ugly side, and one was a more hopeful, forward-looking book. Those are the two big sellers. Uh, you know, Chrétien's more recent books still sell because they have great you know anecdotes and stories in them. But they, uh, you know, I don't think political books sell as much as they used to, in Canada at least, because too many of them are careful. Too many of them pull punches. You know, people find that a little bit boring. And maybe it's a function of they find their politics uninspiring. You know, we haven't had a Barack Obama in quite some time. So um, maybe the books reflect that. Yeah, I mean, particularly on the way up, uh, books like Trudeau's book that was ghostwritten by Jonathan Kay, and there wasn't much uh, secret that wasn't made a secret of. It's just laying out a platform, right? It's, a, it's as you say, it's kind of bullshit. Or yeah. is it? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, if they're aspiring for power or they're in power, the chances are excellent. You're not getting the truth. Or you're not getting the full truth. So help me God. And so post politics, you know, as you were describing earlier, those are the books a lot of people, you know, look for. See if somebody's going to really spill the beans and and so on. One and hopes. Then, yeah, uh, one hopes. And then, but often those books kind of disappoint as well, you know, because somebody's afraid of being sued, or it's hard to verify a fact. Or, you know, it looks like a revenge mission or what have you, you know, because I tend to be less shy and my own boss, I can say what I want. So in my political books, kicking ass in the war room and fight the right, uh, you know, I didn't pull any punches uh, as far as I'm aware. And, you know, I was pretty, pretty open about who I like and who I don't. And I think I was motivated to do that because I find a lot of political books boring. They're yes. not endeavoring to give you the real the real deal. Well, plus the fact you you yourself are a lawyer uh, that that kind of helps. Yeah, for sure. I don't want to get sued. Although I was recently sued by a politician, you know, Maxime Bernier, leader of the People's Party, sued me for defamation. Went on for two years. You know, I could have settled it early on and saved myself a lot of time and money, but I thought to hell with this and. Um, the Ontario yeah. Superior Court ended up agreeing with me a few weeks ago and threw his case out. But I'm I'm different, right? I had the resources and the wherewithal to fight it. Some people just can't do that. So that maybe that has an effect of rendering a lot of the books kind of pablum, you know, make them tapioca. That kind of uh, libel chill. Yeah, for sure. You know, libel chill works. But I, honestly, you know, I think the bigger factor, why are so many of these books boring and uninspiring and end up in the remainder rack so quickly, is the people who are writing them themselves. They're trying to present a sanitized view of reality. They, um, you know, try and cover up their mistakes and their wrongdoing, and they try and exaggerate, you know, their achievements. And, you know, that's not what people want to read. No. When you make a mistake, like in one of my books, uh, actually in a couple of my books, in the war room, I talk at length about mistakes I made. And because in politics, you learn more about, <laughs> you know, you get experience by losing. You don't get experience by winning. It's that experience that helps you in winning the next time. Yeah, uh, it's in life. Anyway, I just wish a lot of political people who are moved to write a book, you know, would be doing it less for the ages and more for you know, commitment to the truth, you know, good and bad. Well, uh, before we leave it, what, what did, what was your take on, or did you even read the, the Trudeau book? Uh, no, you mean the K by K? Yes. No, I didn't read it. Jonathan K was my editor when I was a writer for the national post. And let's just say I was not, I was not motivated to read that book because of the subject matter it was because of the author <laughs> let's leave it at that okay there was an, an interesting little wrinkle at the end the fact that the book was published in china we don't know anything about it and we don't know if monies were exchanged or or anything because i think it was harper collins aren't saying anything and nor is the red cross who apparently was supposed to receive monies from the proceeds 
Yeah, well, I think all of us recall or should that uh, Trudeau, before he was in Parliament and after when he was in Parliament, would take money from charities to do speeches. And I think yeah. that that is wrong. I think that is inappropriate. And uh, he shouldn't have done that. When I speak to charities, uh, I do so um, <laughs> and I don't get paid for it. And uh, that's what you're supposed to do with charities. But anyway, I, I guess uh, we all saw what he and his family feel and how they approach it during the Wee scandal. Moving on to journalists, then, I enjoyed John Iverson's book on Trudeau. Did you read that? No, I did not. I just, I don't want to read books about Trudeau. Like, I think he's a crummy prime minister. You know, I tried to avoid culture that makes me mad. <laughs> so, no, generally, I'm more interested in a you know, I'm a, I'm a columnist for Post Media. You know, I'm not a member of any political party. And, you know, I try to be as uh, neutral as possible. The right. only political involvement I have is with the Democratic Party. I work for Biden. I work for Clinton, uh, you know, because those are not subjects I write about. So, you know, in the case of Trudeau, I, I just think he's a crummy prime minister. And I think people choose books based well, upon who they like. Was- Right, but Ivis's book was very critical. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it documented all of the challenges that Trudeau had with telling the truth, basically. Yeah, yeah, which needs to be done. But again, that would still irritate me. <laughs> you know? I mean, yes, it's, it's like the movies you pick, you know, during the pandemic. You know, all right. of an opportunity to <laughs> choose lots of books uh, and lots of movies, and it's like I'm generally staying away from movies that make me feel shitty. And, right. or make me feel crummy it's a choice i'm making about the culture i surround myself with yeah yeah no i understood i mean you just don't want to don't want to waste your time on this character there's there was also another book that came out uh weary wrote a book on trudeau which was fawning and he works for the cbc yeah. uh, the, and that sort of gets to who funds these books now Sometimes if the publisher thinks they can make money, they'll approach someone to write a book about Tudor or or Harper or whomever, or they'll they'll fund a book. And then, of course, there are these think tanks or even the political parties themselves will will or the PACs will put money up. Do you have much experience with that or thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I do have thoughts on that. In Canada, a lot of people aren't aware of this, there's something called a a block grant. And if you publish a certain number of books, mainly about public affairs, you know, the Canada Council is going to give you funding for that, whether those books sell or not. The Canada Council tends not to fund nonfiction, but Heritage Canada certainly does. Right. So, you know, in those circumstances in a circumstance where the publisher is not going to lose money, no matter what, well, why not write a fawning biography like Aaron Wary did to cultivate, you know, the approval and a better relationship with those who are in power who hold the purse strings. So that's one aspect of our support of Canadian culture. I support government efforts to boost Canadian culture. You know, when we're beside a cultural juggernaut like the United States, we have to do that. I understand that. But I sometimes wonder whether there are um, some accommodations being reached based upon politics and not art. Yeah. There are also some great biographies of Canadian politicians. Richard Wynne, the Northern Magus, and of course his two-volume biography of MacDonald, and then there's John English's Trudeau. Those are, I guess they're more traditional, deeply researched books obviously too there's there can be a spin on those as well can't there yeah for sure i thought you know grit christina mccall newman's book uh her book with stephen clarks and trudeau in our times uh were quite good you know and still stand up steve pakin stuff you know steve pakin at tvo his book the life uh was quite good he did the biography of ontario premier right robards right Yeah. yeah yeah and and bill davis you know, he was close to Davis. He writes about his passions, kind of I do too. And it yeah. comes through, you know, it's it's more, you know, you're getting somebody who respects Mr. Davis, but that's okay. 
because his passion for the subject matter uh, comes through uh, loud and clear. Well, so, passion yeah, those, and honesty, one hopes. That's right. Passion and honesty are critically important. So those ones, I think, really stand out as books about politicians that are, you know, not not autobiographies. Yeah. Clarkson and McCall did exemplary work on the Liberal Party. And again, exemplary because what? They conveyed their passion and they were honest? Anything else? No, they were neutral. They were academics in their approach, but they yeah. were journalists in their execution. Okay. So they, you know, they wrote some really good books. They're dated now, but they're um, you know, Grits, Trudeau and Our Times. Clarkson did another one about the Liberals in power. So, you know, they, there's some good stuff there. Right. Like Gwyn, as you point out, Northern Magus. Yeah. There was a, a series that Penguin put out called Extraordinary Canadians, edited by uh, John Ralston Saul. I thought they were very, very good. I read quite a few of them and interviewed quite a few of the authors. That was more, of, I would say that was more of a patriotic project. Did you, are you familiar with that? Yeah, and he is quite thoughtful. You know, even though I think people would approach some of his work as, you know, the voice of the ruling class, you know, kind of aristocratic voice, you know, given the life that he's held, I, I've come to feel that he is a patriot and he does love the country. And he was writing some of those books with the knowledge that they weren't going to sell. He was writing some of that stuff, knowing it wasn't going to capture the bestseller list. And I like uh, guys like that. I like bands like that, you know, who are, have a commitment to the subject matter and are not interested yeah. in, you know, commercial return. Yeah, he commissioned some very good writers, novelists to do these biographies, these short biographies. But I guess a big part of it would be who they decided to, to write about. There could be a political spin to that. Oh, yeah. You know, there's a judgment you have to perform in writing about some of these people. I'm a big believer in not putting somebody's name on the side of a school until they've been dead for a long time. Yes. You know, we've learned the hard way what happens when you do that and some awful thing about somebody's past comes out sir john a mcdonald being the most glaring example so yeah it's you get you got to pick them carefully uh, because the the ones who are ethical and you know conduct themselves in an exemplary fashion regrettably tend to be the minority these days yeah we're going to have to put aside the conversation about john a mcdonald because we're focusing on books here, but yeah, but he's been the subject of more books than any Canadian political figure. Yes, uh, he has, and it. I guess the point to make is that it would be valuable if uh, people, someone, wrote a book about all of his shortcomings and put that up against the opposite. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, there are prime ministers that actually wrote their own autobiographies. Uh, Pearson did a two or three volume <laughs> door stopper, and so did Diefenbaker. And Mulroney wrote a long, long book that Doug Gibson actually said to me he thought was well written. Yeah, some of them surprise you. Clinton, for example, his book called My Life, also just exhaustive, very long. And he yes. barely wrote every word, and it's well written. You know, when you get, I've known a few prime ministers, and when you get out of there, I mean, it's a pretty exclusive club, like the club of presidents, you know, and you can give speeches and you can join some boards and stuff, but none of that's really exciting, you know, when you've been in the position to boss around armies. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So the yes. memoir stuff becomes very important. And Chrétien, I thought it, uh, you know, I'm obviously biased. He's a friend. So I think he's handled it brilliantly where he's told stories about history, Canadian history, not in a seeking revenge, not fawning, but just kind of telling stories that are revealing. And uh, I thought that's been a, a good way of, of doing it. You know, Harper, I, you know, because he's still active in public affairs, I think he's been careful. Mulroney. I think has been focused on rebuilding his reputation that was lost with the Carl Heinz Schreiber you know, Airbus affair. Uh, Joe Clark's, uh, you know, book, How We Lead. I don't know how many people read that one, but it's like the one who's really stood out of former prime ministers. 
you know, is, is most likely uh, Kretschmann, at least in the, the past 25 years. The Pearson books, I've got those. I actually, I got, I was in a bookstore or an antique store in Brighton, Ontario. And I found, this is, this is actually a sad story I wanted to tell you. I've basically got 100 volumes from the library of Roland Michener. The Alberta Governor General, much beloved Francophone Governor General, born in Alberta, Governor General at a pivotal time in our history. And he had, Nigel, one of the best libraries. So I've got, you know, the stamp indicating that it came from his library. Notations that people made to him. So I've got Mike Pearson's notation, you know, the notes he wrote to Roly Michener. Maybe he just walked it across the street, you know from 24 to, right. to him at uh, Rideau Hall. Mitchner would write in the margins of books and he'd take notes of certain things, things that he wanted to raise with the authors and, and so on. That would always be in the case of books where somebody was being candid and telling the truth. So Pearson's books, I, I, I regret they didn't sell more than they did, maybe because it was you know after he had faded from the political scene. Tell me more about this collection and where'd you find it? Or- I'm not going to tell you because you're going to go there and get some too. <laughs> no, it's um, a little antique shop uh, run by my friend Jack called Marion's Antiques in Brighton, Ontario on Highway 2. And I stop there whenever I'm going to Toronto or coming back. And I always find something <laughs> good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've got one foot in the car. <laughs> 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 uh, I picked it. I picked it clean, pretty good. But there's Mitchner just had this enormous library, and right. uh, like these guys right. would all send their books to him, right? And it was just it's wonderful. Yes. You get an insight into these great men and women. So I I can't believe that I have that here in Brighton, Ontario. But and also because I'm a writer about politics, people will send me their libraries. And, um, you know, I'm sad that the Michener family, his great grandchildren, decided to sell his books. They shouldn't have done that. You know, they should have held on to those. Those are part of history. But I benefited from the fact that they they did sell them. Did you get them all in one shot or did you uh, you sort of? No, you got a picture of it. I know Roland Michener's taste now. (laughs) And um, he had this uh, interest in the Middle East, international affairs generally. He had an interest in Mennonite culture, and possibly coming from the West, uh, Hutterites, Mennonites, you know, on the duality, the linguistic duality of Canada. But he knew all these people, Tories yeah. and liberals, and uh, oh, it's just mm-hmm. great stuff. You got about a hundred. I wouldn't say that many. I've given some of them away. One of my okay. sons is uh, in graduate studies at Queens, and I've given him a couple of books because he. Uh, values that and um, to other friends who are involved in politics and love books. Your father taught at Queens, didn't he? Yes, he did. He was an associate professor. We came back from Dallas. We were in Texas. He was at Parkland Memorial, which is where JFK was taken uh, after he was shot and where Jack Ruby died. And um, we uh, came back to Canada, settled uh, there, and he became an associate professor at Queens. But now my son is a full circle. I don't have the academic distinction either of them do. <laughs> I went to uh, Carleton. I went to Hogsback High in Ottawa. But that's because okay. I was interested in journalism. Well, I went to Queens and I just loved it. I love that place. It's a fine, fine school. Just a fine experience all around. My daughter went there too. It's just, uh, yeah. David from once mentioned to me that a political book is also a great way to get exposure on all sorts of other media. He's one of my neighbors, actually, in Prince Edward County, by the way. Yes, he, yes. He um, took up residence here at the start of the pandemic. He and I are alike in that way. Yeah, I, I've kind of done the same thing. You know, I definitely, uh, I've written 10 books, mostly about politics, but I'm not presently writing one. I'm thinking about one that will make some people very uncomfortable politically. <laughs> Maybe I'll hand it to my publisher the day, day before the undertaker takes me away. <laughs> um, there, actually, I just gave you some news. I'm revealing that to you first. Nobody knows that. I've been keeping a journal 
yeah. every single day of my life, Nigel, since I was 11 years old. And those journals are full of political secrets. <laughs> so I'm thinking about stitching all of those together for one final fuck you <laughs> book. <laughs> we'll see. You're going to educate us and motivate, oh, of course. and motivate us to get involved. I do. In- I, I do. Yeah. I talk and- to young people all the time. <laughs> you know, just, uh, no, but I talk to young people all the time of all, every political persuasion, you know, and they say they want to be a strategist and they want to be this and they want to be that. And they want to be James Carville or whatever. And, you know, my advice to them is always the same. That's all very nice, but you should follow your passion, follow your heart. You know, what is the issue that makes you excited, motivates you and, you know, fills your senses. That's yeah. what you should be focused on, not yeah. political achievement. Work on that. And when you do that, you're going to exceed. And when you exceed and excel, people are going to give you money, right? Not if you're in books, but otherwise, sure. Well, the day is still young. (laughs) People are supporting you for your passion. Yes. That's that's pretty cool. So too many people get involved in politics for self-aggrandizement. And as you know, they need to be getting into it for the right reason. Same thing with the law. People, uh, young people I meet. They want to be lawyers to be rich. And it's like, you know, say to them, you know how much the average lawyer in province of Ontario makes? Like, they never know. This is $65,000 a year. It's not bad, but it's not what you think it is. You, know, you got to pursue these things because you believe in them. You know, I, I gave up a well paying job at my law firm to support Jean Chrétien because of his position on Meech Lake. That's why I joined him. That's why I volunteered for him. You know, and then our relationship grew, and I'm very close to him now. But you gotta you gotta get involved in this stuff because you believe in something. And those are the books that work the best. Those are the books that sing, where it life jumps off of every page, is where you can tell somebody's passionate about a subject. Even if you disagree with them, they you can feel their heart. You know, they like Kretchen's book, straight from the heart. That's what people want to feel. They want to feel that you are committed to that that subject, to that issue. A few politicians do that. Yeah. Any other thoughts on just the whole genre of political books that you haven't already said? Well, it's just an expansion on something I referred to earlier, which is, you know, I know I talk to a lot of the publishers. I suspect I don't talk to as many as you do. Political books don't sell as much as they used to. Maybe in Canada, but certainly... uh... Because of Trump, you know, it's so interesting. He gets people passionate on both sides and gets people really interested in politics because they're scared shitless of them, I think. But the books about yeah. Trump are selling like crazy. A lot of them are remainder. Yeah. True. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, the Trump, the Trump books, you know, Trump, I mean, I worked against him, right? I worked for Hillary. I worked for Joe. He's not a politician. He's a demagogue. You know, he wrote, had some books ghostwritten for him, and they sold well because Americans love celebrities. But, you know, the books, basically, the post, the j- during and post-Trump books are either by people who worship him or hate him. There's no kind of middle ground. You know, so there's passion on either side. And so those books sell. And in the United States, you know, because they're a much bigger country, like in Canada, as I learned, to be a bestseller in the spring, I mean, 70% of our books, as you know, are sold in the fall. Mm-hmm. You know, Christmas. But, you know, to be a bestseller in the spring, you just need to sell 3,000 books really fast. That's it. It's not and, a big number. Um, not a well, big number. It kind so, of gets around to the, the bullshit of the term itself, bestseller. You know, they're just using that as a marketing ploy. Yeah, and like sometimes it's unscientific. They phone around to bookstores saying, what's selling? You know, and they reached Joe Slobotnik and he's like, oh, I, we sold a lot of Hugh Siegel's, you know, book, No Surrender last week. <laughs> and it shows up on the Toronto Star list. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's totally, totally ridiculous. What counts is the hard number. So my book, Blowing My Own Horn, The War Room, which Dundurn published first in 20, 2007. It's in its like fourth printing. That is about political strategy, I'm guessing. Communications, yeah, uh, how to do a political ad, 
what quick response is, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's dated. I don't have Twitter in there or Facebook or any of the other things that are so important in politics now. But it still right. tells. Right. It wasn't a huge, it wasn't on any big bestseller list of time, but it's been a slow, steady customer. You know, it's been selling on a consistent basis. Okay. And do you think maybe your, your uh, presence on Twitter, obviously it helps it, right? Yeah, for sure. But it was selling before Twitter existed. I think, you know, I'm an unusual case, uh, as my mother will tell you. You know, I tend to be very blunt, which is kind of my punk rock schooling. You know, I, I, I tend to call it bullshit uh, or try to whoever is propagating it, whether they're on the right or the left. So some people like that, but a lot of people don't, you know, because they're partisans themselves. So I'll get notes from conservatives saying, you're the most unbiased writer in Canadian politics when I write something critical of Trudeau. <laughs> and then when I write something critical of O'Toole, as I've done this week, you know, you're full of shit, Kinsella, and you're in Trudeau's pocket. <laughs> well, partisans don't, right. partisans don't think, number one. And, and number two, you do it. No, they don't. If everyone pisses on you, you're doing a good job. I guess it's the same with Andrew Coyne. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, just just uh, winding down about that that book of yours and your experience with it, did you take the contents of that from? Because I know you t- you teach a course in communications. Is that what you did? No, uh, other way around. No, I did uh, kicking ass in Canadian politics. Came out. This will tell you all you need to know. On September the 9th, 2001. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, kaboom. Beautiful. Kaboom. So that was the end of that. So all you know, that anybody I mean, you know wanted what? to read that fall, all yeah. that anybody wanted to read that fall was yeah. either stuff about Islamic extremism or fantasy. They wanted to escape. So a book like that, which is about politics and you know being tough in politics, just died. So... The, I went back to that book. I took some of it, not all of it. And that's how I, that's what I brought into the war room. And I added new stuff and so on. So no, my political, uh, I teach uh, at a law school, how to communicate for lawyers. We don't get into many discussions about uh, politics. Okay. Well, just finally, if we could sort of recap, you know, say you're, you're in the war room, but the election is, let's say, still, I mean, I know maybe you don't have a war room two years out, but maybe you do. So let's say that the election is a couple of years out. How would you use a book? Like, how, what would, how would you do, approach that? We go through them. You know, when Kim Campbell, when Mulroney left, I was running Kretchen's war room in opposition. Cargill and Stephanopoulos, Stephanopoulos helped me set it up. That's you right. So I had one guy doing Sheree, I had somebody else doing Perrin Beatty, you know, Edwards, you know, whoever else was singing running. And I had well, Kim sorry, Campbell. Sorry, what do you mean? I don't understand. Researching them, knowing oh, everything they've ever them. said and done. I see. Okay. So I read everything there was to read about Kim Campbell. And there were a lot of books that came out that summer about Campbell when she became leader. So there was Murray Dobbins' book, The Politics of uh, Kim Campbell. Bob Fife uh, did a book about her called The Making of a Politician. And they were useless to me. Interesting. They were totally useless. Right? And why is the, that? Well, because it was all sanitized. It was all careful stuff. I see. Sure. She'd been yeah. careful. So what I did is I went back to Peter C. Newman's interview with her when he was smart and he brought along a bottle of wine and she drank it and she said all kinds of outrageous things. And, and so the primary source stuff was much more useful to us in a war room context than a book. Very rarely does a book have an impact on the political cycle. And a good example of that is my friend, Jody Wilson Raybould's book, Indian and the cabinet. I think a lot of people thought that was going to blow up the election campaign. I never did firstly, because I know her. She is a lawyer. She was Attorney General of Canada, and she had uh, a lawyer's obligation to preserve the secrets of her client, which was the government of Canada. So as much as she would probably like to tell those stories, she can't. So Indian in the Cabinet, I always knew was going to be an important book because we'd talk about her feelings and you know the emotion of it. 
of that terrible time, but it was never going to you know, blow up the election campaign because she had not been released from her obligation of her client, which was Justin Trudeau, to tell the truth. She did yeah, a book right true. away, and I interviewed her about that book, and it was basically just a bunch of speeches that she'd written. I wished that it yeah. had been a book that was shitting all over Trudeau, but it wasn't. She can't. She can't. But what about this? She's bound by solicitor client privilege. Right. But what about like down the road here, two or three years or two years later, she she released it right before the election. And she did say quite a bit that was damaging. Yeah, no, but it was about, no, yeah, but it was about feelings and how he was a jerk. Feelings. That wasn't exactly news, right? In law, as I teach my students, privilege belongs to the client. Right. And um, Trudeau is the client. You're saying that she couldn't run through exactly what happened because of this. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Yeah. I I know it. She can't. She'd be disbarred. I see. Okay. But I mean, she didn't hold back on on the fact that she on the feelings. Yeah. You know, that he's an asshole and would roll his eyes. Yes when she spoke and put up his hand in front of her face and, you know, right. all those terrible things, you know, she talks about that, but saying here is how my client, Justin Trudeau sought to obstruct justice as he clearly did 11 times in yes. that fall. Yes. You know, she couldn't tell that story because she's bound by solicitor client privilege. That's very interesting as it pertains to, to books, obviously. Yeah, for sure. Well, there's also the cabinet confidentiality. They abused that. That this is, is right. Yeah. They're selective in their the attention they pay to the, the cabinet confidentiality. Exactly. Uh, some of them, I think, are rigorous about it, but I think you're quite right. I think some of them are full of shit. Okay, and just it's funny you should mention Kim Campbell and, and Jean Chrétien. I remember that election, and I remember how pissed off I was that... Kim Campbell would be criticized for saying basically the truth that it's very difficult to explain and predict unemployment numbers. I remember being so pissed off about that because she was telling the truth. And then Kretchen said, yes, yes, I know exactly what it's going to be. And he fucking got elected. It bugged me. That no, all- but that wasn't the issue. It, that it wasn't bugged the issue. me, though. The issue was <laughs> that she sounded like she didn't care. I, I, was I disagree. Crutches. That was why, you know, we, well, you know, the, the I got, we got several million votes on my side of the argument. And yes. your side of the argument got reduced <laughs> to two seats. You know, what she said, she's right. right. It is tough she, talking she about told the, She told the truth. In, let, in me finish, let me finish. Let me finish. I know. Yeah. She, you know, it is hard to talk about complex issues at any time because they're complex. Yes. yes. The problem was she sounded like she didn't give a shit. It yeah, hurt she her. did give a shit. No, she didn't. No, she uh, didn't. We'll okay. have to agree to disagree. Okay. Okay. So uh, just to, just finally then, this back to your father about the fact that ethics were so important to him. And yet it's so difficult to be ethical in politics, it seems even ethical when you write a memoir or a book about politics because there's always this spin i don't know i don't think so you know you tell the truth and you treat people with respect and you know with the dignity that they deserve so i i don't think that that's hard i think that's uh I mean, certainly that's the way my parents brought up my brothers and i so yeah i've been privileged to work for two politicians who I think, conducted themselves very ethically. The two I've been most closely associated with are Kretschy and McGinty, you know, who won three majorities each. And they won those majorities because the perception was, you know, I know their partisan opponents don't feel this way, but they, you know, conducted themselves with some integrity. Uh, you know, I think the reason why Mr. Mulroney's party was reduced to two seats is the perception was he didn't. Yes, but did, weren't there sponsorship scandals and nuclear power scandals? Like, Yes, absolutely. But I'm talking about, you know, in their personal capacity, you know, Christian didn't enrich himself in sponsorship. There was wrongdoing principally by uh, conservative ad people in the province of Quebec. And in McGinty's case, you know, he didn't benefit personally from the, the uh, gas plant thing. To the position he took was actually favored by all the political parties in the legislature. 
No, you know, I'm talking about people meeting in the Pierre Hotel in New York City and getting envelopes full of cash from an yeah. airline lobbyist. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, so final point. What you're suggesting is that really the only books worth reading are by passionate, nonpartisan <laughs> pundits like yourself. <laughs> Read, yeah, yeah, read my books. No, I mean, there's some good stuff. There's, there's lots of good stuff out there. There really is. And, you know, and you should actually endeavor, any of the young people listening to us, read stuff you disagree with, too, because you may learn something. Don't just always read stuff that is congruent with your own biases and your own prejudices. You know, open your eyes. You know, that's a big problem with our politics today, is I feel people are just staying within their ideology. And, uh, you know, our politics suffers for it. But, yeah, I think there's still some good stuff out there. I think there's still some people committed to the truth. Sounds like Like, you are. Kritzian's stuff is is a lot of fun to read. They're gentle books, but there's some truths there. Obama's stuff, he's endeavored to tell some truth and give some insight. You know, and some of the political consultants, I know Dick Morris has become very controversial because of his personal conduct. But I met him and talked to him in his book, The New Prince is probably the best book about how to prepare for a campaign that I've ever read. That's useful. Uh, Thank you. Carville has helped me with uh, a lot of stuff. You know, and he has these little books. They're almost booklets. They're fun. He puts recipes in them. You know, it's really his, you can, his personality really comes through with his books. And, and Paul Begala, who has helped me on some of my stuff. And uh, the two of them, you know, they're characters. I love characters in politics. I love people who are you know, have personalities. Both of them have personalities. But there's some real interesting insights, some useful stuff in those books that people can um, uh, learn about how to do politics. You know, those are the of the political consultant books. Those are good. When are we going to get the Kinsella Diaries? <laughs> the revelation that I gave you. It's a big one. I'm an old bastard now, so like, uh, how long have I been involved in politics? There's a few decades in there i got to go through. But I've got notes, Nigel, on everything. I've got a publisher for you. <laughs> all right, you can be my agent. Yeah, i got it all. <laughs> like, I know. I'm taking very careful notes of what people actually said over the years. So hopefully some and people are listening to your podcast right now and getting a little nervous. You're committed to getting it out? Well, I'd like to. I mean, you got to get a publisher, right? That's No, I mean, there's a commercial aspect to this, too, as you know better than me. It has to sell, you know? Of course. It's not yes. merely enough to be a prime minister. you got to have something that people want to buy. And that was the thing about Kretchen with his books, who, you know, Random House is my publisher and his publisher. They love his books because his books sell, whereas, well, you know, Joe Cox it... or Hugh Siegel's don't. Yes. And as you've said... The reason that they sell is that people enjoy reading more than one or two pages in it. Yeah. yeah and you, you know, he's described it to, to me himself. He said he's designed them so you can sit down, you know, and read a bit and you can put it down again and pick it up again. And you haven't lost anything. That's great. Well, thanks so much for sitting down with me, Warren. My pleasure. My pleasure. It's an important subject. I'm glad you were doing this because people want to learn about politics. They should read more and uh, listen to your podcast. Very good. Thanks. And if you want to get more of Warren, just follow him on Twitter. It's a lot of fun. Thanks again. (laughs) Thanks, Nigel. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.